on the Dallas Opera Network. You're listening to Opera Box Score. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Wherever you are, however you're listening, it's Opera Box Score. I'm your host, George Cedar Quist, joined on America's Talk Radio Show about opera by Oliver Camacho, Matt Cummings, Weston Williams, and Ashley Hardgrave. All right, listen up. One, we're taping on Monday, November 2nd, and two, we're not going to talk about politics. Okay, kind of. Ashley takes a page out of You Know Who's playbook and talks about some nasty women in opera. And then, it's one of our biggest scores, when this held and soprano found out we were doing an episode about nasty women, she said, hold my beer. Christine Gerke goes inside the huddle with Oliver and Ashley to talk about her friendship with the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg and singing Brunhilde in a Mustang. Plus, two-minute drill. European opera houses shut down and everyone is writing angry letters about it. We got the whole crew here tonight. And can I just say, first and foremost, congratulations to the L.A. Dodgers. I've been waiting years for this, mostly for my dad, who... uh Grew up in L.A. as a lifelong Dodgers fan. He remembers when the Dodgers moved from Brooklyn to L.A. So, Daddy, that one was for you. Aww. Oliver, how's your sports week been? Me? Uh, I mean, I haven't been watching sports because I just finished Pledge Drive at my other job. But I did hear today that one of the Chicago Bears hit one of the New England Patriots. So... Uh, it was the New Orleans New Saints, Saints, but okay. yes. <laughs> So Bears versus Saints, I mean, Bears are going to win. Like, if we just talk about actual Bears and actual Saints, you know. And actual Saints. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless the Saint is St. Francis. Unless the Saint is St. Francis or Leonardo DiCaprio. So. Meanwhile, over here, Pittsburgh's still undefeated. 7-0, and baby. We know, Matt. Sorry. Stillers, Stillers. Sorry we know. about it. <laughs> Ashley, your Bears and Hogs, uh, not so I, much this week. No. No, they're both down. I'm too nervous to pay attention, so it doesn't matter. I will pay attention next week. Carbs also Weston, don't count this week, if anyone's counting. Yeah. Are you nervous, Weston? Uh, about the election? Yes. But when times uh, get tough, I can just cradle my beautiful OBS scarf and just think, roll tide. So soothing. So soothing. <laughs> that was bizarre. All right, <laughs> let's talk some opera. Chalk Talk on Opera Box School. Four years ago, our nation was shaken to its core. Despite overwhelming odds, the unthinkable happened. On a chilly night in November 2016, most Americans, especially those in the Midwest, found themselves in shocked disbelief. Many were in tears. The Chicago Cubs had won the World Series. Okay, so we're an opera sports show, and we're not going to talk politics, especially as by the time this show is released, the 2020 election will be over. Mm. Or not. Anyway, we want to take a different angle on politics and opera by looking at some nasty opera women. Ashley Hardgrave, our resident nasty woman, tell it like it is. All right, friends. This is the election special, but... A, like we said before, we're taping on Monday, which is election eve, and B, by the time this drops, we still may not know the results, and C, we are not here to make endorsements. If you want mine, DM me and I will gladly give them to you. So, (laughs) instead, let's get back to the notion of what an election is. What, What does it mean to vote? Voting is having your voice heard. It's agency, it's representation, it's standing up for something, anything, hopefully yourselves. Particularly for female-identifying folks, this agency has not traditionally been an admirable trait. Our opinions haven't always been wanted. Women should be seen and not heard. Or, in the case of opera, women should be heard only between the rise and the fall of the curtain. So, today we're going to take a look at some movers and some shakers of the past century. The nasty women who used their voices in opera world to stand up for what they thought was right no matter the cost. All right, gentlemen, quick disclaimer. This ain't everybody, thank goodness, and this isn't even the whole story for any of the folks I'm going to talk about. This is an incomplete list of badass women that did badass things, and it (laughs) should inspire you to go learn more and find others. How excited are you guys? I'm so excited. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. So I kind of broke this down into three categories, political dissidents, trailblazers, and the category that I'm calling, I don't think so, honey. So, first, we're going to talk about some political dissonance. Let's get into it with Maria Fedorova, later Jorella. 
She was a leading soprano at Vienna State Opera in the 1940s. And while she was studying and getting notoriety, World War II was afoot. Oh, that? Her first... Yes. Oh, that. Just, you know, just a World War II. Uh, her first husband actually was helping hide Jews as the war approached. Soon he had to get out himself. Unfortunately, he was also eventually shot to death. Um, she continued, however, to be part of the underground, and she was sheltering Jews in a secret cellar compartment in her home. She even saved her Jewish music teacher. One time she saved a teenage girl by dyeing that girl's hair blonde and dressing her as a maid. She had a printing press in her basement to create birth certificates for Jews to establish non-Jewish identities. The Gestapo also Almost caught it once, but they were apparently distracted by a cute tiny dog that she had. Uh, by the way, she made her state opera debut in 1944 and was a favorite of Franz Lehar, who ended up casting her as Hannah and Mary Widow. Yes, all uh. of these things were happening at once. And during a war. During what a, a time. War. Where is the biopic during on this war. woman? It's amazing. She is amazing. Uh, she was a singer that traveled constantly, and as such, she was often suspected of espionage. She was questioned repeatedly by the Nazis, and unfortunately, towards the end of the war, they did actually take her to jail and beat her. After the war, she said, quote, they had the nerve to ask me if I worked with the Gestapo, and I finally pulled up my shirt, revealing the scars on the back, and said, that's how I worked with the Gestapo. Oh, damn. Now she did. Yeah, yeah. It was it was intense. Uh, she did remarry. She moved to New York in the 1950s, but she'd really come to associate music with the pain of the war, and as such, she didn't really perform ever again. Mm. Uh, she said, "Quote: The memories were just too painful. I didn't want to sing or even hear music again, so I gave up my identity, everything." It was only through an urging of friends about 30 years later that she picked up everything in the 1980s and started to teach and became a sought-after instructor in New York City. The Jorella method became a whole-body, back-to-basics approach that she used in her Manhattan studio until passing away just three years ago in 2017. Damn, what, what a story. From, story. from hiding Nazis to master teacher. <laughs> or hiding from the Nazis to master teacher. Sorry. Uh, let's clear that up. Goals. Whoa, whoa, goals. Compositions are important. <laughs> they they absolutely are. I was so blown away by her story. And you're right. I want to see a biopic on this woman. I want it to happen. Uh, any producers that we know are listening, let's get on <laughs> Do we have any more? Oh, no, too late. <laughs> Do we have any more uh, biopic pitch, pitches in the making here, Ashley? Well... Let's move from World War II to uh, Soviet Russia in the 60s and 70s <laughs> to Galina Vishnevskaya. Now, are any of you guys familiar with her? Yes. Oh, yeah. I've heard the oh, name yeah. before. She's honey, polish, passion, charisma, one of the most dynamic Tatianas of the last 50 years. And she was rarely allowed to sing it in the West at the height of her powers, of her voice. Also happened to be post-wars, well, one of post-war Soviet Union's most prominent political dissidents. Honey, this woman lived a life, and she knew how to stand up for herself. I'm going to give you a couple little tidbits before we get to the big story. Okay, so at the beginning of her career, she had tuberculosis, like right as she was getting famous. And the doctors told her the only way that she would survive is if she allowed them to fully collapse one of her lungs, which sounds bizarre, but at the time it was the conventional method of healing because there weren't a lot of antibiotics in Soviet Russia. Yeah. Uh, she, yeah, sure. So she knew if she said yes, she would never sing again. And that was too important to her. So she backed out of the procedure and recovered on her own with what antibiotics bought on the black market. <laughs> Phenomenal. Okay, Ooh. step one, step one. Step two, she almost didn't make her premiere at the Bolshoi, which is the theater that made her famous. She'd won a contest to do a solo there, but uh, she was almost dropped because she complained that the, quote, traditional production of Eugene Onegin was too boring. <laughs> yes, I love this woman. She eventually was allowed to offer her own more animated interpretation of Tatiana, and that ended up becoming her signature role. So she was definitely right. She yeah. was absolutely right. On a lot was of it things. a Zeffirelli um, production by any chance? I can't remember. <laughs> Zeffirelli. I was going to try to ro like Russianize it, but it, it would have gone off the rails far too quickly. But the thing that most people know Galina for, she was this big six or big star in the 60s. But again, she wasn't allowed to perform outside of Russia too much. Uh, fun fact, Britain actually created the soprano solo in the War Requiem for her. She couldn't get out of Russia to go to England for the premiere. Oh, man. She got fed up uh, and started getting vocal. Around 1968, Soviet troops invade Czechoslovakia. In her memoir, she says, It seemed the most disgraceful act in the history of the Russian state. And that is saying a lot, friends. Uh, <laughs> she and her third husband, uh, violinist Mstislav Rostropovich, 
Yes, I got it. <laughs> uh, began to publicly criticize the government. They began associating with Soviet dissidents. They they got Nobel laureate Alexander Solnitsyn. I said that incorrectly, but you know who I'm saying. They let him live and write from their house while he was under attack by Soviet authorities. So they were like harboring him in their house. Uh, but still, she's this huge opera star in Russia. She gets the highest prize in the country, which is the Order of Lenin in 1971. It was immediately rescinded, and she and her husband, Rostropovich, became recognized as political dissidents. She <laughs> continued to criticize the lack of artistic freedom in the Soviet Union while she was touring abroad. And then the Kremlin decides, well, madam... You are an ideological renegade, and they immediately revoked their Russian citizenships in 78. Can you imagine? You're on the road, and then, by the way, you can never go home again. Uh, so they live in exile for a number of years throughout the U.S. and Europe. Uh, they were finally allowed to return to the Soviet Union in 1990 at the behest of Mikhail Gorbachev, the last head of state before the collapse of the communist regime a year later. So just in time. Uh, so she gets back to Russia. She goes on to found an opera center and a foundation that provides health care for children. She even starred in a film. But for me, it's that political voice and the few recordings we have of Tatiana that are the most memorable for me. Uh, and Weston's going to roll some footage for us here. This is Tatiana's letter scene in Eugene Onegin. This is with the Bolshoi in 55. So this is as her star is rising. <laughs> And I would like to correct something that I misspoke about a little earlier. I got excited and called her husband a violinist. He was actually a cellist. A big violin. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a basically thing. a violin. You can't really hold it there <laughs> at any rate. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, her Tatiana is, is it's really heaven. beautiful. It's I, so incredible. I really it hope just... that that uh, that more of those Melodia recordings that she made under the Soviets get released over here eventually. Like, as... Mm things continue to cool off from the cold war because like we are missing out continuing to cool from the already uh, cold yeah <laughs> it's gonna exactly. be very chilly before they actually release it hi talk hi, us hi. through some of the trailblazers <laughs> correct uh so let's move on one of the first people i'd like to speak about is marion anderson ah oh, the reluctant revolutionary First black singer at the Met. Toscanini calls her a once in a hundred years talent, but her hometown school, the Philadelphia Music Academy, wouldn't take her as a student because she was black. So she studied privately instead, knew she'd have to go to Europe to develop her career. And as that career grew, Europe was loving her. Meanwhile, her country's segregationist policies back home kept her away. At one point, she did put a clause in her contract that she would only play integrated venues, all the while knowing that that would mean a noticeable police presence. So here's some Strauss. See a cop. Great. Uh, in 1937, no hotel in Princeton would house her after a performance at the university. She was invited, however, to stay at the home of a local scientist who would become a friend for life. Anybody know who that is? Albert Einstein. Oh, wow. Who? <laughs> that no. Albert Einstein and Marian Anderson. Like BFFs. This. Yes, correct. So, you know, folks know her as, oh yeah, first black singer at the Met. But we need to talk about the nut or the big performance that some say is one of the defining moments of the civil rights movement. Truly iconic. We'll break this down real quick. Howard University is invited her to perform on a concert series in 1939. She was already pretty famous at the time, so they had to find a place that was going to be big enough to hold the crowd they knew would come. So they were trying to book D.C.'s Constitution Hall. There is a problem. It was owned by the Daughters of the American Revolution, and the D.A.R. had a whites-only performance clause in every contract. Mm. One of the members of the DAR was First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who immediately resigned from the DAR upon hearing about Marion. The DAR doubles down. The American press supports her right to sing. A kerfuffle ensues, and the First Lady signs on to help organize an outdoor concert at the Lincoln Memorial. Jokes on the DAR because 75,000 people came to the Lincoln Memorial to hear her in the clip we're going to play to a radio audience of 
millions. Uh, so this is the V performance from the 1939 concert at Lincoln Memorial. Uh, there are a number of other clips that are preserved in the Library of Congress that are pretty easily accessible. Um, this one is, is great for me, in my opinion, because you can hear the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ix, who helped organize this concert, say at the beginning, genius draws no color lines. And you will notice that she changes a lyric. I'll see if you can figure out which one it is. a big part of the civil rights movement. <laughs> I hope you can tell why. Um, while we talk about Marian Anderson, I do want to mention one other uh, lady of the time, Camilla Williams. So while Camilla, sorry, why, while Marian Anderson is the first black singer at the Met, Camilla Williams actually was the first black singer to get an American opera contract mm. in 1946, which is even earlier Ugh. than that Met debut. And it was also one year before Jackie Robinson made his baseball debut in oh, the integrated league. So wow. yeah. So Camilla Williams was also there. She's not mentioned as often, but I think it's really important to, to mention her as well. Um, but while Marion and Camilla were opening doors, Miss Jessie Norman kicked it down. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. It made me happy. Uh, so <laughs> Jessie, you know, we've talked about Jessie a lot on the show. We don't need to get too much into her bio. But basically, she, she grew up in the Jim Crow South, but she did not understand racism. It didn't make sense to her. Her family was a very civically active family. They encouraged strong opinions. Uh, when she was a little kid, she put her hands over her ears in elementary school assemblies when they played Dixie. Uh, as a college mm. student, she marked with carry, you know, with out of Vietnam signs. And her brother actually dropped out of med school in the 60s to join John Lewis and Dick Gregory on the voter registration drives in Alabama. So wow. pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, let's see. Ah, yes. She studied in America. But she had to cultivate her career in Europe because, guess what, there was more opportunity for her there. She became very big in Berlin in the early 70s. She waited until 83, though, before she made her Met debut. Even in Europe, she was very vocal about equality, and she stood up against injustice. There's this really interesting uh, moment from director Robert Wilson. He said after attending an opera performance in Amsterdam, they encountered police attacking a black guy on the street. Norman asked them what was going on. And in Wilson's own words, quote, the police said it was none of your business. And she said, it is my business. We went to the police station with the man and waited all night long. She refused to leave until they released him. So wow. Just a, just a thing to think about. Her and Robert Wilson <laughs> in Amsterdam going to the aid of a stranger. I think that's just really indicative of... of so much about her. You know, she was a big supporter of Democratic candidates, Clinton, Obama. Uh, she was actually asked once if she would run for office. And she said, I considered it. And then I put it aside. I don't think I would be successful because I would not be able to hold back on what I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesse Norman for president. Am I right, guys? I Seriously, I totally wish she would have run. Uh, she is a huge hero of mine on this topic and music. But this topic, too, I, this sums it up for me. Uh, my favorite quote. If you're paying attention to the world around you, if you're participating in life and politics, it makes you a fuller person and a fuller artist. Come on, come on. And we're going to see we're going to hear part of that fuller artist right now because I think we have a clip from her Met debut. The very same. Yeah. Yes. Roll that footage. <laughs>
Uh, I love that monologue from Cassandra. That's from uh, Hector Berlioz's uh, Les Troyens, the Trojans. Uh, and, you know, there's something to be said about Cassandra, who was prophesying doom, and no one was listening to her. <laughs> oh, God. Well, little, little something, little something there. Uh, in addition to these types of trailblazers, we're going to shift to a whole other type of trailblazer. I can't say that word. Did I have enough coffee? I can't tell what's <laughs> happening. Uh, we're going to talk about your friend and mine, Ms. Patricia Reset. Friend of the show. Mm. Friend of the show. You know, she was established in her career. She was singing at the biggest houses in the world. She'd already won the Richard Tucker Award. She made her Met and La Scala debuts. But where she really sent some shockwaves through the community uh, was when she decided to come out publicly and publish her coming out statement in the June 2002 issue of Opera News. It might seem like it feels silly right now, but it was really revolutionary. I remember being in grad school at the time, and it was the talk of the school. All mm-hmm. we could talk about is, can you believe, can you, can you, even though they had been like out and anybody that knew them like in their work and personal lives, they knew her as out, but she'd never done it publicly and um, 2002 was a wildly different time for those policies wildly Absolutely, different yeah. time gather around children let me tell you what it was <laughs> like um you know and the other thing that made this so revolutionary was that her now wife that she was coming out as being in a relationship with was another opera singer the fabulous mezzo beth clayton you know beth has said in previous interviews you know they've been asking them to come out for several years but Patricia was a lot further along in her career. Beth was just kind of getting started. So they wanted to wait until a time when both of them had really kind of hit their strides. They were, you know, they wanted to be famous separately. They didn't want to just be famous for this. But at Mm. the same time, it was all sort of the same to them. You know, if it was up to them, they would have been interviewed three days after they got together. So, Mm. you know, Reset never regretted her public coming out and instead wishes she could have done it sooner. And, you know, she says, quote, along with singing and marrying, it is my proudest accomplishment. Hmm. Uh, both Patricia and Beth, they continue to sing and exist and be together and be <laughs> activists. Uh, and she says, quote, that we are out and proud is activism at its finest. We want to be a part of the fabric of this life, just like anyone and everyone. She does have some choice words for who is currently the president as of this taping. Quote, he's dismantling all the rights that it took so long for us to get. All I can say is come November, vote, 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 vote vote. I could play a lot of clips of either of them because they're both super, super good. Uh, but the one that matters the most to me in this moment is uh, their It Gets Better video. Take a look. In 2002, my partner Beth and I decided to uh, come out and print. And uh, I was asked a lot of questions about that. Number one was, you know, was that scary? And for me, it was scary for a moment. Um, but I soon and quickly realized that it was worth no price. The Price wasn't worth paying to not be true to myself and to my relationship. Right, Beth? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Hi, I'm Beth Clayton, and I'm also an opera singer, but more importantly, um, Pat and I have been partnered for over 13 years. 13 and a half, almost. Yeah. Yeah. We even tied the knot in 2005 to yes, make it official. So you're my wife now. I'm your wife. Absolutely. <laughs> and when she did do this article we're talking about in 2002, it was kind of an interesting time for us because it became congratulations on your on your cover, like you collectively. It was like our magazine together, which I she pinched of, my cover. I sort of uh, <laughs> horned in on her. You did uh, like, because it's all about Pat's career. But what it did for us personally was this great sense of validation as a couple, mm-hmm. and for lots of people who were who were young and struggling have come to us and asked, you know, you know, did this really make a big difference in your life? And we said. Yes, it did. It felt great. Now for the final category, the newest generation, the ones that I call the I don't think so, honeys. Uh, (laughs) It's so good. Uh, So there's a big movement happening right now around bodies in opera. Mm. There are a lot of women, female identifying folks in opera that have gotten really fed up with the disparity in gender and the emphasis of physical shape over sound. Uh, It's been a problem forever. I know I've got my own stories about being told to lose weight, to get work. I'm not alone in that. Uh, there's a couple of folks that have opened their mouths recently, and I'm really excited to give them sort of a quick a quick shout out. Uh, one of the first six years ago was Alice Coote. I don't know if you guys remember. She's amazing. Uh, when, when Tara, oh, first of all, she's amazing. Second of all, when Tara Erot was at oh, yeah. Glyndebourne and the critics called her dumpy and a chubby bundle of puppy fat. Ugh. Okay, so what Alice did that was so amazing is she went on the record in written word. Uh, a lot of people were kind of talking about this, but she's the one that like went down in print and gave it to the critics and was like, we need to talk about this. 
this art form is about the human voice. That's what tells the story. That's what moves people. This will die if we keep going down this road where we celebrate, you know, body over sound. Uh, and then just last year, our girl Catherine Lewick, she came out and shamed her shamers right on top of things as soon as they decided to call her a fat woman in a tight corset. Uh, there's some amazing quotes, but one of the things that I absolutely love from from her back and forth uh, with Develt was, you know, to attack unspecified female members of the cast as Dicka Frauen, this is the work of a lazy chauvinist seeking pats on the back from his fellow hooligans. You're right, Catherine. It is. You're right. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we know her, we love her, friend of the show, Jamie Barton. Jamie Barton has really come into her own to speak on the social medias about body positivity, social justice, LGBTQ rights, but one of the things that really inspired me the most about her was when she took to Twitter last year to basically reject all of diet culture and talk about how it had been detrimental to her body, her life, her relationships, her artistry. You know, to sum it up, as she said, diets do more harm than good for the vast majority of people. Health is possible at every size. I am healthier in every single way for walking away from dieting. And since she's singing in the best voice of her life and she's more popular than ever, I would say she's doing it right. Amen. A freaking man. Uh, quick shout out to Joyce DiDonato. Um, she's she's nasty and she's outspoken, but she's doing it in a slightly different way. She's uh, she's kind of taking the Beverly Sills approach and going into non-opera medias. Uh, you know, she's on Sesame Street. She's doing all these contemporary music recordings. She's singing for her beloved Kansas City Royals. Uh, and while she's doing it, she's showing cultural relevancy. She's making patriotism an okay thing. She's encouraging civic engagement. And more than anything, you know, she gets that this music that we love and do can beat for the people if we just go to them. So right. shout out to Joyce Cedonata for that. And finally, this is for the women. This mention isn't about a specific artist. Uh, it's more about the gratitude and the thanks to the multiple women that are finding their voice and speaking out against sexual harassment in the industry. For Domingo, there's nine, all with strikingly similar stories. At Paris Opera, there's Chloe Brio, and another, and another in what we know is a not-so-well-kept secret for decades. While Me Too has been a much wider-than-classical music moment, the women of this art form have had the courage to speak out, and they've played an integral role. And while we don't know the final outcomes in some of these stories, what we do know is that no justice would have ever been done without a fed-up woman finding your voice. Mm -hmm. And so to the Patricia Wolfs and the Chloe Brios and the I Fear Sadly More to Come, I say thank you. You deserve to be heard. Your story matters. And because of your bravery, the culture is changing. It's a new day for a simple reason. Women are being believed. And that's a great place to close this. This week, for better or worse, will dawn yet another new day for all of us. And the female identifying folks of the world should know that we stand on the shoulders of all of these nasty women. For every one of us who's ever been told that they're too much, too big, too loud, too opinionated for this community, your day is here. And each of us should feel emboldened enough to say what we long felt but may have been afraid to announce. That's not okay. And I'm going to do something about it. Huddle up. Let's go inside the huddle. I can't believe that she agreed to do this. Um, Christine Gerke was a true delight. Um, Ashley and Christine actually spent the first half hour talking about like their curly hair maintenance. We did. <laughs> we spent so much time talking about hair products and it was amazing. That will be bonus, uh, bonus <laughs> content for our, our donors and subscribers. <laughs> um, and I wanted to talk to her about you know, her galvanizing tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and singing in Twilight Gods, that new Gotodamarung Redux by Yuval mm. Sharon. But Ashley actually kicked off the interview with a prompt for Christine to explain why she gladly takes the mantle of Nasty Woman. You know, it's very interesting. Just this morning, I saw a friend of mine sent me an article. Um, Classic FM had posted something, and it was about the idea of retraining uh, for all of the artists in the UK. Just retrain, rebrand. And I'm so offended on their behalf. It is, it is so much work, what we do. And another friend of mine is currently in Paris working on a job. And she is from the UK. And she wrote and said that she was astounded because 
they are saying that, you know, essential work can happen. And apparently rehearsals, recordings, performing is considered essential and they have notes. So to me, there is a great discrepancy as to what is considered essential in our lives. That said, to think of what we do as a hobby, look, it's a great hobby. It is a great hobby. I encourage everyone to go and sing in the shower, get outside, join a choir, do your tap dancing. I still try and I'm disastrous at it, but I love it. The arts enrich our soul no matter how we come in contact with them. For those of us who decide to do this for a living, and we try to do this for a living, holy cow, the ups and the downs uh, are epic. Um, and it's funny when I, I talk to young singers, they're like, what, what's your best advice? And I said, well, you know, a lot of people used to say, you know, if you can do something else, do it. But if we're here in this situation, it's because we can't do something else. It's because our, our whole soul makes us want to be part of this thing mm -hmm. that is an offering to others. And it always has been. Um, the kind of things that are sacrifices. I mean, look, 50 years ago, even, people were still being told, don't have a family. You can't have a family and do this if you're a woman. Are you crazy? Yep. Don't do that. Okay. Um, not true. <laughs> we can save that for later but also not true. Um, and you know, there is great debt incurred. You know, there's great debt incurred in school, no matter what field you go into, but most fields, you have a decent shot at getting a job straight out of school. And with your great debt, you know that however long it's gonna take you to pay it off, you will support yourself and hopefully go forward. There are no guarantees in what we do. The sacrifice is the precariousness of what we do. That's part of it. Um, we sometimes do have to put our personal lives on hold. That is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if we don't, how do we balance our lives? That is very, very difficult. Um, I, I can't speak to the men as I am not one. Surprise. Wait, <laughs> I did a blowout. So y'all know this is like, <laughs> thing, so not one today. Um, but it's it's different, I guess, I think, for women. And the interesting part about the whole nasty woman thing, do we advocate for being that thing? To me, it's like the word diva. It used to be this, you know, it, it used to be this thing that was, we didn't want that. We didn't want that. Oh, you're acting like a diva. Now, diva. <laughs> it means something different, right? So in the beginning, when somebody said, you're so na you're a nasty woman, and now it's like a badge of honor. Yeah, now it's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. But isn't it though? Yeah. Because oh, are, are you, generally that means somebody has a problem with me standing up for myself or standing up for my daughters or standing up for someone who is not able to stand up for themselves. I am super good with that. I'll get the tattoo right here with the anchor. I'm good to go. <laughs> I, I love this. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, since we've just touched on family, I kind of want to dovetail into that topic because I think that is, you know, for a lot of folks, one of those sacrifices. You know, we're, we're always interested in reassuring young singers that they can, in fact, have a family, have children. And by giving insight into, you know, the singers that we talk with, their family structure, their support system, you know, how they navigated pregnancy, candidly, before and after with, with contracts either coming up or on the way or trying to get booked. We actually did a whole episode uh, for Mother's Day on this, but everybody's story is a little bit different. Uh, so I would love to hear a little bit more about about your story, what you would be comfortable sharing. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm happy to share whatever you want to know. Um, I I knew I, I never wanted to be a singer. Santa face wig. What? Uh, <laughs> no, I, really, I never wanted to be a singer. It was not even in the furthest reaches of my mind. I was going to be a band director. I was going to my big goal was to get married. Oh yeah, I'm super band geek. I still have my bass clarinets put together right in the corner so I could practice Stop later. <laughs> Stop it. I am also a banner. We're gonna talk about that later. Off mic, go ahead. Oh, okay, let's yes. do it. Um, also captain of the color guard. So that got me lots of dates, Barry Sachs, bass clarinet and color guard. I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was a majorette. We'll also talk about that. Oh my goodness. But, but you got to wear the cool stuff. But we're, we're getting off topic. We'll talk about yes. that later when we talk family, about family. family. Yes, okay. exactly. <laughs> So the thing, I didn't ever want to be a singer and I didn't actually understand the huge project it was going to be. 
Right. You know, I mean, the dumbest thing I ever did was think, oh, well, they like my voice. Maybe I'll just be a singer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God, that's the dumbest thing ever. And then I realized what it entailed. Because honestly, so I was raised Catholic and we all go through our little religion training classes and we got a book when we were preparing for our first communion. And in the book, (laughs) there was a page that said, draw a picture of what you want to be when you grow up. (laughs) No children. So I drew myself working at Kentucky Fried Chicken because I thought I'd get free chicken. (laughs) That's life goals right there, friends. Boom. Um, And then next to it, it was me going home to like 47 children. That's what I wanted. Kentucky Fried Chicken and kids. Uh, that the bars are, are, those that's are how the magic goals. food ends so yeah i feel like that's right i mean oh my God, welcome. <laughs> i can i can be very happily be a spokesperson if anybody's looking for one so fine uh pivot <laughs> anyway so um i i always wanted to be a mom desperately um and the rest of it it all fell into my lap i and i thought you know I went through college i didn't really meet anybody i'm now in the middle of this amazing career that's dropped into my lap. I mean, I, I worked really hard, but I didn't expect it. And I thought, you know what? Maybe this is what God's giving me instead. And maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So let's do it. So I did. And I still really wanted kids, but you know, for those, this is back to the sacrifice thing. You know, we put the blinders on when we are really starting our career to try and make this happen. And then the infamous bump in the road happened for me when my repertoire started to change and my voice changed. And I didn't know if I wanted to continue. And I thought, you know what? I have done so much and I didn't expect any of it. And I'm so proud of it. And maybe it's time to walk away before I feel bad about what I did. And maybe this is the time that I go get to have the rest of my life. Yeah. Okay. It's not a bad switch out. I'm good. I wasn't good. I was sad, but I thought, fine, let's go and find these things. And so I finally started dating at like 32. So I really didn't. And uh, I was terrible at it for a while. No, I was still, I was really bad at it the whole time. (laughs) But somebody was apparently stupid enough to grab me. So that's fine. Um, I, I was online. We, I met friends of friends and uh, you know, I finally ended up in a situation that I thought, I think I get to have this now. Okay. And I met my husband and we got married. And I remember I was so mad because six months had gone by and I wasn't pregnant yet. And he's like, you realize that might be an issue because we've been in the same place for six weeks. And I was like, do better. (laughs) (laughs) But like five minutes later, we were pregnant with our first. And, um, you know, it was... It was interesting. I was just starting to sort of transition into this bigger rep. And I had to give up um, an Elizabeth and my the only time I've ever been offered and also a Dutchman. And I was never offered another one of those. Go figure. Okay, fine. I got the most gorgeous, brilliant, fabulous, colicky baby. <laughs> and I... <laughs> was not quite prepared for the it takes a village and friends it takes a village um your village can look like a million different things if you have family god bless uh you have somebody who can come and help you out amazing uh we didn't have a lot of family and we went through a series of au pairs and nannies and they're all, these ladies are all still like my kids and they are all part of my family and they always will be. Um, but it, it was a lot of work and it was difficult to try to find the balance of home and work. And in the beginning, the littles traveled with me. <clears throat> we had a conversation about school and what's going to be best for them. And my husband and I decided that it would be best for us to get to know the kids first to see, are they social? Do they need socialization around other kids? Is homeschooling a thing that might work well for them? And we decided for both my girls, they, they do like the socialization and they do need one place to be. So that meant once school started, mom was off on her own and having to leave the kids at home, which was 
the it just my heart broke every single time I walked out the door and my children were reaching for me and I cried all the way to the airport and mm. I cried through TSA I had to explain so many times to the TSA agents what was going on because they were like um and you know I will say this I thank god I started at a time when the internet was a thing because without FaceTime, without Zoom, we, we wouldn't exist right now. But without FaceTime, without Skype, I, I don't know if I would have continued. And my daughters will say it is not the same as a hug. But yeah. <laughs> I know it's true. I mean, I can't reach out and put my arms around my kids. But we talk twice a day, every day. And if it meant me having to get up at two o'clock in the morning to be with them on the ride to school, I would do that. And then I would get up for a half an hour, go back to sleep for another three hours or four hours or whatever it is. Um, but it was difficult and it was hard for me and it was hard for them. My husband and I, we knew in the beginning what the potential was for travel and being apart. And thank God we are both people that are good with being with each other and being without each other. And I think that's really important when you are in a relationship with somebody who has to travel for work. Um, and my, you know, my girls, they're so happy right now. I mean, it's not so great that mom's home for eight months, <laughs> God. but they, they're mostly over the moon, but they're also just new teenagers. And so they're either over the moon or they hate me. So I must be doing it right. <laughs> uh, I, if you've got tweens, yes, yes. The fact that oh. they feel both ends of those emotions. Yeah, I would, uh, I'd say you're nailing it a little bit. Oh my bit. gosh, because hashtag the puberty. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, it's real. It's, it's real. My niece is on her way and boy, howdy. Um, <laughs> whew, uh, I do want to rewind a couple of years um, just because I'm, I'm always curious. This part of the story always fascinates me. Um, when you think about the birth of your first child, can you tell me a little bit about your first roll back? Do you remember yep. what it was? Yes. Uh, I do. Oh my gosh. I do because there wasn't a chance I was giving it up because nobody lets me do funny things and I'm really good at them. And three months after I had my first, I was scheduled to start rehearsals for Aliche at Upper Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I don't care I'm going to say this. My manager will hate me. I don't care if you pay me with like a tuna fish sandwich. I would turn up to St. Paul stuff. I love it. I love to have fun. I love to sing a liche. So there was no way I was giving that up. And I'm like, okay. And it's also kind of an ensemble thing. It's a really good one. First back in. I was so tired. <laughs> so Maggie had colic. I was so terrified. First babies, we are a hot mess. Second babies, we're like, whatever, this was on the floor. Hold on. Here, put that in your mouth. <laughs> but the first baby, everything makes you want to jump out a window. You're like, oh my God, she's going to die. Um, she picked up something from a neighbor's yard. I know. So we went to the doctor with her at about three and a half weeks. I was like, she's not sleeping. I don't know what's happening. I, I don't know. And she goes, oh, right on schedule. And I said, for what? She goes, the C word. And I go, she has cancer. She said, colic, colic. She has colic. And I was like, oh my God. I didn't sleep for three months. My husband and I took shifts. Um, he had to go to work. He would take a five hour shift at night or a four hour shift at night so that I could sleep. And then I let him sleep for four hours and he went to work and I was with her all day. She cried all the time, poor baby. Colic, no joke. So colicky baby mamas and dads, namaste. Uh, it's, I was so tired and I was terrified because she was howling and we had to stay in corporate housing. And the day before we left, it just stopped. She was like, whoo, that's over. Sup? <laughs> like, who the hell are you? Where's my child? So I went down there. I was exhausted, but I was sleeping for the first time in three months. And it was, oh gosh, it was amazing. I had so much support from my colleagues. And that's the part I wasn't quite sure what would happen. You know, I mean, we all panic about what does it mean to be a mother now? And not only a mother, a mother who brings their kid to a gig. And mine just like turned up at lunchtime in her stroller with my mother at the time. She's like, bit of bit of, there you go. They were 100% in my corner. They were there to help. They were there. Do you need anything? All of my colleagues as well. Um, the singing part of it, I was 
pleased and surprised to find that it, I was 100% there. Now, I had C-sections. Um, mm. I did try. God bless. But we just unzipped and got her out. Boom, done. <laughs> Both of them. But it was three months I had to recover from an operation. And um, my doctor was amazing. I was terrified because that was the thing I said. As a singer, I didn't want a C-section. And she said, why not? And I said, because those muscles pay my mortgage. Mm -hmm. And she goes, if I swear to you that I will move them apart by hand, I know what you do. Will you let me go get your daughter? And I went, <laughs> yes. She's still my doctor. Um, and she delivered the other one too. And she most certainly did. She was super careful. And so... This is the thing I will always tell ladies who are pregnant and, and you're scared about what's going to go on. Have the conversation, have that conversation with your doctor. It's, it's not a big deal either way. Um, and I, I went back in feeling like, you know, I was so grateful to have everything, but here's the thing. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, because you might get it. And then you have to figure out what to do with everything. And, uh, that is an ongoing process. Every single day we navigate that here in my house. Mm -hmm. But we all talk about everything. I get an offer, dinner table, we talk about it. So, I mean, it, it has to be a family affair at this point, you know? Well, I'm glad the family okayed this interview. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that we have to like take a pivot here, but uh, I want to get to this topic. I remember waking up, I forget exactly what day it was, but, um, you know, just scrolling through Facebook, like the morning, like try to get myself out of bed. And there you were uh, in Lincoln Center Plaza singing Up Shirley Sure. And I was like, okay, this is happening. And I knew that you were going to be doing something because you were like talking about it, but I know exactly what it was going to end up being. And I'm watching this thing. And I, I remember getting out of bed that morning. I was like, okay we can do this, we're gonna face the world, <laughs> you know? I didn't expect the amount of catharsis that came out of hurling all of that out into the, you know, five block area around Lincoln Center <laughs> that day myself. Um, and we did it like four times. And so I was like, either everybody in this area is going to know the aria by the time we're done, or we're <laughs> going to have an angry mob. <laughs> um, why did I pick it? So I was lucky enough. Actually, I'm laughing because I'm sitting at my piano right now and I was cleaning things out and I, I pulled up my little envelope just now. And I don't know if you can. Yep. So mm -hmm. this, this is my little packet of pictures from the, uh, <laughs> I did one of um, Justice Ginsburg put together um, um, musical, you know, as a little soiree every year uh, for the Supreme Court and invited people to come and sing. And she invited me to sing this year, oh, last year in November. So, oh my gosh, it was almost a year ago. And uh, she, she, I was just sort of saying, these are the dates, these are the things, who are you bringing, you know, what are the people involved? What is happening here? I have a little ski jump going on. <laughs> it's a swoosh. It's a swoosh. It's a little 1970s Farah. We'll run with it. Um, I support I, I do too. So uh, I wrote back and I said, what are her favorite things? And they said, what do you mean? And I said, she's invited me to do this. What are, what, what are her favorite pieces? Can I incorporate these pieces in the program? What does she love? And they came back and said, well, she loves Strauss and she loves, um, she loves Fidelio. And I thought, 
I can't do Abshorlisha. It's too long. I'm doing this with Luca Pizzaroni. We've got to find something to do together. And we ended up doing uh, the duet, well, the, the melodrama with Rocco and Leonora at the beginning of the second act. Yeah. Well, it's not really it's after, well, yeah, the tenor has an aria, but whatever. So um, <laughs> uh, la, 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 something about the dark. Um, and uh, I thought, right. When they contacted me from Lincoln Center and asked me to be a part of a tribute, I said, I thought there's no, there's nothing else I should be doing. Absolutely nothing. And nothing speaks more to this woman's legacy than standing up for people who cannot stand up for themselves and for doing something, even though it's difficult and scary because it's right. And to go places where you are not invited, even if it means you have to sneak in. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to start getting all misty again. This, um, mm. it's too late. <laughs> Damn it, estrogen. Um, it's, uh, this was everything that the woman stood for. And I, I don't think I have the picture of my daughters with her, but um, she allowed my daughters to come into her, her chambers and to meet her. I'm looking through my little pictures here to see what I've got. <laughs> These are good. <laughs> These make me laugh. Okay, tall people. Oh gosh. <laughs> it's like Fazel Fafner, Ruth, and whoever else happens to be standing there. <laughs> and uh, here's another. And just the Craig. She, I know. I I'm looking at a handwritten note from her, which I'm not going to hold up because I'll start crying again. Oh. But um, I I was really scared because I swore I didn't want to sing that one again. It was it was a lot, and I I the last time I did it, it was too close, and you know I it's it's not really a shock to everybody that I am like super bleeding heart liberal, but I have seen. The, the scariest thing that's happened to, to this country, I think, in the last four years is the division and the intolerance of other people's opinions. And I am as guilty of it as anybody at, because emotions are running so high. And the last time I sang Fidelio, I was like, I can't do this anymore right now. It's too close. It's too scary. Yeah. And I want to do better. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to step away from this. But I knew it was the only piece that I could possibly do for her. And... By the way, it's really hard to sing. <laughs> It's a ridiculous aria. It's impossible. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. insane. But, By a but, it's guy. insane. But B, like, how do you sing that without an acoustic? How do you sing that in open air without yeah. knowing? Outside. Can okay, you give but us a actually, <laughs> I will tell you, I was terrified about that as well. So walking out there, first of all, all of the, the feels from walking out on the plaza, I hadn't been there in six months. And walking up there and seeing all the lights out and burlap bags, everything's outside and just you know, barricades everywhere. I just like, part of me wanted to throw up, part of me wanted to hug every building. Um, and then I was terrified because the aria is hard. It's really, it's the high profile. It's for Ruth. I want to do the best that I possibly can. This woman is going to be my personal superhero in forever. And so then I said, right now, I don't have any idea what the acoustic is going to be like. And they're like, here's a microphone. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> great, let's go. Um, it turns out that three giant stone buildings in the shape of an amphitheater <laughs> work like an amphitheater. Oh, wow. Awesome. Um, I hurled out that in the rehearsal, that first Abscheulicher. I, with such vehemence, and I was so angry, and I stopped afterwards, and it came back from like five blocks away. 
And I thought, even if I sound like crap, this is totally going to be worth it. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I was greatly surprised. Lincoln Center keeps surprising me. We have lots of outdoor areas that things can happen. Now, I realize I woke up this morning, the wind chill was 28, and nobody wants to be hanging out outside. (laughs) But, uh, you know, having just completed one of the the tours of one of the great parking garages of North America. I'm um, so glad you brought that up. So (laughs) we we can do stuff outside. I think we just have to find the ways to make that happen right now. Well, this we have to wrap this up, but I do want to get oh, a preview. I want to get a preview of this Yuval Sharon Twilight Gods. And I don't know if you saw it yet, but in the current issue of the New Yorker, which I think goes to print like next week, um, it's reviewed by Alex Ross. Did you see that yet? I did. And I knew that Alex was there. And I was so excited that he, I mean, I knew that people were traveling from mm. states away. That's a huge thing right now for people yeah. to travel to get in the car <laughs> right the but i tell you what it was very interesting um i don't read reviews it's like a thing of mine yeah i but it's alex reviews. ross come on <laughs> okay it's alex ross who i actually he's like one of my heroes okay. um i got the book and everything um and uh i i was so so happy and Yuval sent me a little note saying that he had been in touch and said he thought it was awesome and he goes good sign good sign and i was like good sign but i I was so excited about this. And when they approached me about the project, um, I didn't know a bunch of things. He's like, you know, we're thinking about this. And I said, I'm in. He goes, I didn't tell you the rest. And I said, don't care. (laughs) We're doing a thing. You guys are courageous enough to try something. I'm there. Let's do it. And all of these things started coming in. Well, we're going to do this there. Well, you're going to be outside. Well, it's going to be the top floor. We don't know if there's going to be any cover for the weather. Fine. In fact... This was not the one that Alex was at, but there was this Sunday evening performance. We looked at the weather and thought, oh God, you know, everybody else is on a lower level, so it's no problem, but I am out in the open air on the top of this thing. And uh, they said, okay, there's a thunderstorm coming in. And I said, do we know if it's a thunderstorm or just a storm? And they said, no. And I said, right. Okay, well, I have an earpiece because I have to hear the band and I have a mic on so they can go to the cars. So am I going to get electrocuted if I get wet? And they said, no. And I said, let's do it. (laughs) My friend happened to be in this rotation. I got up there and it started pouring and I kept going. And he said, I didn't know if I should wish for less rain or more rain. It was like the (laughs) Elmer Fudd part of what's opera doc. North wind blow, south wind blow, smog. It was the most amazing thing. And I have never had so much fun in my life. Well, Chicago audiences are in for a treat. I cannot wait to see this thing. And you have like the new pull quote for your press packet. Christine Gerke in the role of Brunhilde summoned all the vocal heft and emotional force that she has brought to conventional stage outings. And she showed an extra glint of glee as she jumped into the Mustang to ride onto the metaphorical pyre. <laughs> Listen, if you're gonna go for a pyre, get in the Mustang, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's a very interesting way to conclude your experience of the ring in Chicago. And I wish we had time to talk about the David Poutney ring, which you were just about to complete. Uh, yeah, but, another time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're a nasty woman, Miss Gertrude. It's how I do. It's how <laughs> in the I do. best ways. Badge <laughs> of honor. It's Badge been of honor. so great to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on to Upper Box Score. It's a total pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. This just in, the two-minute drill. All right, listen up. Here's everything you need to know about what happened in Opera Land this week. Responding to, quote, one of the worst professional gender imbalances in the country, Canadian opera companies Tapestry Opera and Pacific Opera Victoria have partnered to launch the Women in Musical Leadership Fellowship. The three-year fellowship is set to foster the careers of six female-identifying and non-binary music directors and conductors, with a broader mission to expand the talent pool in Canadian musical leadership. The Donizetti Foundation has announced Donizetti Web TV. The new web channel will be dedicated to the works of the Bel Canto era composer, as well as interviews and insights into the work of the protagonists of the pit and of the stage. Hey, maybe the Fabiano doc can debut on the Donizetti channel. 
In order to honor commitments to its artists, Chicago Opera Theater is pivoting its previously announced performance of Rimsky-Korsakov's Caché the Immortal into a recital featuring singers from the originally scheduled cast. Will Liverman, Annie Rosen, and Wilbur Pauly will star in Rimsky Rebooted, a virtual performance on Saturday, November 21st. In the COVID corner, 150 opera singers gathered in the London Parliament Square to perform Va Pensiero in protest against the lack of government support for freelance musicians during the pandemic. We've spent years and years and years training to be what we are today, and then to be told, well, actually, you're at the bottom of the pile. It's just damn hurtful, says soprano Natalia Romanu. There are so many people who feel forced to turn to other industries or retrain. It's such an insult. Despite those protests, the Royal Opera House and English National Opera will be shut due to a countrywide lockdown beginning November 5th. Along with German opera houses and concert halls, that pill was particularly bitter to swallow for the Bayerische Staatsoper, which had been holding performances in a cavernous concert hall for 500 spectators over the past month and where no corona and virus infections have been detected. Stage director Nicholas Bachler said he did not understand why public transport and shops were able to keep going while the opera had to close. Quote, we have a disciplined public. It is possible to master the risks. It's not an adequate decision. In an open letter, a variety of German performers said, these last months, we have the impression that we're worth less than cars, planes, or footballers. And Carnegie Hall has announced that all performances and events are canceled through April 5th, 2021. The decision leaves only the possibility of performances at the very tail end of the Hall's 2020-2021 season. Carnegie Hall has been closed since March 12th. Update from last week's drill. Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has responded to Riccardo Muti's call to reopen concert halls and opera houses with a firm no. Said the Prime Minister, The criterion that guided us was not that of indiscriminately targeting a sector considered superfluous compared to others. Instead, we intervened in all those sectors of activity, dining, fitness, and entertainment, which offer opportunities for sociability, whether high or not. I didn't know you ghost wrote for the Italian government, Ashley. <laughs> and exit stage right, French soprano Edith Selig has died at 91. Selig, who specialized in Bach and French repertoire, leaves behind a number of recordings, including Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice. Longtime conductor on the Metropolitan Opera music staff, Scott Burgesson, has died at the age of 69. He also conducted over 300 performances at New York City Opera, as well as performances at other leading U.S. opera companies. Gabriella Jenica, one of Germany's leading scenic and costume designers, has died at 68. A prominent artist, she worked on over 150 productions throughout her career at companies like Oper Leipzig, the Deutsche Oper am Rhein, Theater Bonn, and Oper Graz. Conductor Alexander Verdernikov has died at the age of 56 due to complications from COVID-19. The Moscow-born conductor became the music director for the Bolshoi Theater in 2001 and also served as music director of the Mikhail Mikhailovsky Theater and the chief conductor of the Royal Danish Opera. And on this day, November 2nd, in 1833, the first performance of Cherubini's Alibaba ou les 40 voleurs in Paris. French stage producer Patrice Cherot was born in Les Ignes Maine-et-Loire in 1944. It's the birthday of American soprano Ruth Falcon in Residence, Louisiana in 1946. And also in 1946, Italian conductor and composer Giuseppe Sinopoli was born in Venice. In 1954 was the birth date of Scottish soprano Marie McLaughlin. And finally in 2006, it was the first performance of Jake Heggie's To Hell and Back. And that is your two-minute drill. So that was the late Ruth Falcon slaying <laughs> in Strauss's oh Fruling Spire with the oh, Munich God. Radio Orchestra. Oh, Rest in peace. Oh, man. So good. That piece is Fruling's Fire. I'm telling you what. 
<laughs> Thank you, Matt. Thank you. It was an emoji <laughs> joke for Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> Pat- Pat- Patricia Rowe died in 2013, but his real seminal production was at Bayreuth in 1976. It was a ring cycle. The Industrial uh, Ring. The, it was the Industrial Ring cycle where the the Rhine was basically flowed through this huge nuclear power station. Oh. And, and no, I mean, it was so topical. And it was so massive, and it was like the perfect venue and the perfect time. And, and that was pre Chernobyl, right? Absolutely, oh, yeah. Chernobyl was in the late uh, late eighties. Um, just a, a incredible performance and uh, incredible production. Speaking Ashley, of- yay for Canada, yay for women. Yes, yes, but more importantly, let's look at another phrase that's super, super key in that announcement: non-binary. Mm. Yes, I know that I have spent this entire episode talking about women and the advance of women and their time is now, but let's say we open this gender spectrum a little bit, so I'm really excited that they mentioned non-binaries. We can always count on Canada to be a good upstairs neighbor. <laughs> in, in case we ever have to go over and visit for an extended period of time. In like 60 days, maybe? Yeah, I mean, who can I say? Know. Who can I say? Who oh, knows? Who can say? So I have a question, and what it is, was Donatetti TV conceived specifically for me and Oliver? <laughs> and, for, and, so- and for Francisco Salazar. He's crazy about Donatetti, too. So Oh, get him on our, bar- get him on our party. Yeah. Um, and if so, can we exercise our veto of Domingo being allowed on the channel? Hmm. Uh. But is it is it like going to be like twenty four seven? I mean, is that's yeah, the only way, way to do? Yeah. <laughs> that's the only way to do Belcanto Fest. Yeah. Like C span, oh C span, just like a little like a little camcorder in the back, and they just keep going with the Belcanto. I love it. Man, are they pissed off in Europe or what? Everybody, everyone Ooh. is writing letters. It, it's. Ooh. Uh, mm-hmm. I th- I think it's actually a very interesting phenomenon looking at uh, what appears to be, uh, shall we say, some greater resistance uh, in this wave than the first wave. And uh, I think that probably comes down to a little bit of a bad influence by a certain across the pond neighbor that we are currently sort of sitting in ourself. And I think my message to uh, a lot of the people uh, across the pond who are complaining about you know um covid restrictions is like yeah i mean yeah we, uh, for us the first wave never finished you know we haven't been able to do any theater at all it, and it's 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 just very frustrating to see these sentiments crossing uh crossing the water and sort of taking hold um but that being said i do understand the frustration because uh, even in Europe, uh, which we often uh, on the show praise for taking care of its artists a little bit more than the U.S., they are being left out in the cold. Um, very literally, it's winter after all. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's one of those things where we, we need to keep in mind that we as performers, as artists, need to keep putting pressure on governments uh, to not just vote, but to also you know, demand the things we need to survive and keep going and keep creating and make sure that this art form and we survive until uh, until the pandemic is finally over. All right, let's wrap this show up. Good call. Bad call on Opera Box Score. Wow, a truly heartfelt bumper show and yes we did talk politics <laughs> just Sorry. a little bit and it was just a it was pretty thrilling this this isn't political though uh toby wright former uh, co-host and i with our fantasy football team with the opera philadelphia pool are now a, a sparkling two and five so mm. we're, we're almost as uh almost as bad as the cowboys Ooh. <laughs> uh good call pad call Oliver Camacho. Haymarket hey Opera, which pivoted to an all-digital season. Their first production is now available. I think it's on November 8th. I'm not exactly sure, but go to Haymarket Opera. And friend of the show, Kimberly Jones, appears as Galatea in their production of Aces and Galatea. Matt Cummings. Uh, the Teatro Gran Liceu, which is in Barcelona that had to shut down, is broadcasting their performance of Don Giovanni, which features some of my favorite currently singing performers like Maya Person, Veronique Jean, Ben Bliss, and Christopher Maltman. 
uh, that'll be available on their website on the 8th. Weston Williams, you really are too tall for a soapbox. <laughs> Ashley Hardgrave. I am not. Um, I have lots of soapboxes, but this is a good call. Joyce DiDonato just released a new video over the weekend, uh, her Sing for Today series. It's just her and a guitarist, Alex Garibay, doing This Land is Your Land. And it is simple, and it is hopeful, and it is beautiful. And for any of you that for any reason might need some sort of soothing and nods to positive patriotism in the next couple of days, I would encourage you to check, I would encourage you to check it out on her YouTube. That's it for this week's edition of America's Talk radio show about opera. Our announcer is Norm Waddell at normwaddell.com, N-O-R-M-W-O-O-D-E-L.com. Our theme song is Vodka Inferno, written and performed by the Diablo Swing Orchestra. On Facebook, search for Opera Box Score. Be sure to share and comment on our posts. On Twitter and Insta, we're at Opera Box Score. A podcast version of our show is available on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. You can always tell us what's on your mind operaboxscore at gmail.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opera Box Score are solely those of the show's creative team. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of the accounts of this show without the express written consent of Opera Box Score would be totally cool. Our creative consultant is Oliver Camacho. Our audio and video editor is Weston Williams. For our guest, Christine Gerke, and your co-host, Matt Cummings and Ashley Hardgriff, I'm George Cedarquist, asking you to continue the conversation about opera more often than just every election. We're back with an all-new show, November 11th, on the Dallas Opera Network. More opera headlines, more hot takes, more nasty women. Or at least one nasty woman. Join us. <laughs>